Okay, so hello everyone. I'm very happy to welcome everybody to the first installment of the fall program of the Leuven Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. So my name is Pavel Reichel and I'll be chairing the session today. So today our session will be devoted to a recently published book, The Experiential Turn in 18th Century German Philosophy, edited by Karin de Boer and Tinka Prunea Bretonet, published in 2021 with Routledge. I'm going to turn the floor over to the editor shortly, who will provide a brief overview of the book. But first, I will put a copy of today's program into the chat. And I'll say a few words about it. So um, let me upload a document. So you should have a document in the chat, a Word file, which you can download and look at the program. Okay, so as you can see from the program, our first speaker today will be Matteo Favaretti, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Ca' Foscari University of Venice, the author of numerous works in the history of philosophy in general and in 18th century philosophy in particular, of which I'll just mention, firstly, Miriology and Mathematics, Christian Wolff's foundational program published in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy in 2019, and Bodies of Inference, Christian Wolff's Epistemology of the Life Sciences and Medicine, published in 2016 in Perspectives on Science. Matteo will provide a commentary on chapters written by Christian Leduc, Alessandro Nani, and Anneli Grosse, who will then have an opportunity to respond. Our second speaker today will be Ursula Goldenbaum, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Philosophy at Emory University. Again, I'll just mention two recent publications. One, the um, very well titled, Who Was Afraid of Wolf's Psychology? The Historical Context in The Force of an Idea, which was published with Springer this year, 2021. And secondly, The Pantheismus Streit, Milestone or Stumbling Block in the German Reception of Spinoza published in Spinoza's Ethics in 2011. Okay, so I'm going to um, pass uh, a discount flyer. So there's a discount flyer for the book and I'm going to upload that into the chat and simultaneously I will pass uh, the floor to the editors of the volume who will provide a brief overview. And just before I go, I'll just remind you that we'll leave the Zoom meeting open after uh, 7 p.m., uh, after the formal termination of the talks, to have an informal discussion. Okay, um, Karen and Tinka, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Pavel. And um, yes, I, I just wanted to um, express my gratitude also in the name of Tinka. Um, to Matteo and Ursula for uh, joining us today and giving their uh, views on the volume. And of course, also, I'm, ve I'm very pleased to see everyone. And um, of course, we're also very grateful uh, to the contributors to uh, accept our invitation to contribute uh, to the volume. So the idea of this um, book goes back to a conference Tink and myself organized in 2017 on precisely uh, the concept of experience. And at the time we thought it would be uh, very interesting to look at the developments in 18th century German uh, philosophy from the uh, perspective of this concept of experience. Experience is an interesting concept in our view because it is normally associated with empiricism and, and in particular with developments um, in um, England and Scotland. So um, according to the traditional view, um, Kant's philosophy is uh, the first to, as it were, synthesize uh, British empiricism on the one hand and rationalism uh, on the other hand. Now, um, uh, the volume that we introduce today um, seeks to challenge this uh, picture of, of the developments in 18th century philosophy because we take it that the uh, historiographical opposition between empiricism on the one hand and rationalism on the other hand is not very um, uh, accurate. 
and it um, it makes it very difficult to see uh, the complexity of the debates that were going on at the time, in particular uh, in Germany. So in a way, the volume intends to study the many ways in which German philosophers during the 18th century sought to emancipate experience from its subordinate position uh, in relation to, uh, to reason. And um, the various uh, contribu uh, contributions to the volume explore this, um, uh, this new way of, of dealing with experience, not only um, with regard to scientific cognition, but also with regard to psychology, uh, religion, art, and the various branches of philosophy itself. So put in more general terms, um, we take it that the volume seeks to show how German 18th century philosophy sought to navigate the tension between two uh, main models of uh, cognition. On the one hand, the classical model of a priori reasoning exemplified by math mathematics, and on the other hand, the a new model of experimentation um, that was successfully um, employed within uh, the modern natural sciences. And so in a way, um, uh, these various German philosophers, regardless of their various intellectual backgrounds and aims and so on, um, at least on our view, they can all be said to uh, to struggle with this tension and uh, try to find uh, a particular solution. Now, um, one of the challenges that we uh, faced both during the conference, but also uh, in, in preparing the volume is that the concept of experience itself is kind of uh, unclear and it can uh, receive very different meanings depending on the context. So um, many philosophers uh, treated in the volume appeal to the role of experience, either experience in general or inner experience in particular, to counter speculative claims made in, um, in classical uh, metaphysics. Yes, yeah, so they, they, they appeal to the model of experimentation in order to uh, determine um, uh, the limits of, um, of philosophical claims. However, in many cases, it's not very clear what it means to appeal to experience and experimentation in, uh, for instance, disciplines such as psychology or the various branches of philosophy. So we hope that, um, that the various chapters shed some light on, uh, on, on what is actually um, meant when philosophers um, um, appeal to experience in order to um, side themselves with the <coughs> modern uh, developments as opposed to uh, say classical uh, Leibnizian uh, philosophy. So I think that, um, that this is um, uh, an interesting aspect of the, uh, of the collection of essays as a whole. Uh, and I also um, think that um, the various contributions demonstrate that uh, it is uh, very um, um, useful uh, to uh, abstract from this classical historiographical opposition between empiricism and uh, rationalism, uh, because uh, these labels do not really allow us to, um, to understand um, the, the real um, nature of the debates and struggles uh, that were going on at the time. I now hand over to Tinka. Thank you. I will say a few words about the, the structure of the book. Um, first of all, um, a few points. Uh, we believed that um, the problem of experience already played a decisive role in the 17th century, and therefore some of the chapters talk also about Leibniz, uh, Thomasius, and Chinhaus and their influence on the 18th century. Um, 
the second point would be that there is a part of the Berlin Academy and we um, thought it was really important to deal also with the Berlin Academy as part of the of the German Enlightenment and as uh, an important actor, a philosophical actor at that time. Um, and uh, the third um, point would be that the uh, the structure of the book has Kant uh, in the end, so the last section is devoted to Kant and Tatens, uh, but we did not uh, mean to um, suggest a teleological reading of the 18th century as um, some of philosophers leading up to Kant. Uh, we we tried and the authors of the chapters to to deal with the authors uh, uh, for themselves. Uh, the book uh, the volume has four parts. The first uh, is devoted to Wolf and Wolfianism. Um, the first chapter by Cory Dyke um, sets the scene by examining um, the influence of Chinhaus treatise on method on Wolf's early conception of the mathematical method. Uh, and uh, on Dyke's account, um, Chin House uh, informs uh, Wolf's uh, earlier works. Um, but at the same time, um, he brings out the features of Wolf's understanding of the method as uh, um, that has to be employed in all sciences. The next chapter turns uh, Christian Loduc. Um, chapter turns to Wolf mature work uh, and considers uh, his understanding of the relationship between ontology, cosmology, and experimental physics. It focuses basically on uh, the Cosmologia Generalis of 1731. Uh, the final chapter of this first section uh, by Alessandro Nannini deals with um, Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten's views um, on the aesthetic dimension of experience. Um, Nanini um, wishes to make two uh, important points here. Uh, he wants to, he shows, and we will discuss this in detail um, later. Um, he shows on the one hand that Baumgarten took the discipline of aesthetics to provide the various types of experimentalism. Um, with a unified epistemological uh, framework. And on the other hand, that he took his aesthetics to teach aestheticians how to achieve the highest goal of aesthetics that is beauty. Uh, in the next, the next uh, section, um, with, which is titled Eclecticism and Popular Philosophy, uh, we also have uh, three chapters. The first one by Stefan Hesbrüggen Walter deals with the Thomasian context, the Thomasian piety school. Um, he analyzes not only Crucius' concept of experience, but also how uh, this concept became a subject of debate uh, in the Thomasian school uh, in authors such as Rüdiger, Hoffmann, Sirbius, and Bude. Uh, the following chapter by Udo Thiel examines 18th century accounts of inner experience in Feder, Lossius, and Kant, uh, and show, shows how uh, these authors engage with uh, Lockean views and uh, influence the Enlightenment as such. The last chapter of this section um, by uh, Falk Wunderlich engages with the Göttingen professor Christopher Myers and Michael Hoffmann, Michael Hoffmann, and focuses uh, on their materialist uh, uh, reading uh, of the human mind. The third part is devoted to the Berlin Academy um, and comprises also three chapters. The first is devoted to Maupertuis. Uh, it's written by Anne Lise Rey. Um, uh, and there she um, deals with uh, uh, Maupertuis' um, attempt uh, to uh, forge a middle path between metaphysics and experiment and uh, between Leibniz and Newton. The next chapter is devoted to a less known uh, academician, um, Forme, and uh, analyzes the psychology, uh, his psychology as informed by Wolf um, and Newton at the same time. And it, it is written by Anneli Grosse. She will uh, give us details later. And um, the next one is devoted to Lambert and also, and, by Paola Basso and also analyzes this middle path 
uh, that Lambert sought uh, between uh, experience and deduction. Um, the next uh, chapter, um, my own, is devoted to um, Jean-Bernard Merillon, um, to his eclectic philosophy and the understanding of experience, and uh, I focus mainly on his critique of Hume. And the last part, the fourth one, um, deals with Tetas and Kant. Um, Courtney Fugate uh, investigates um, the role granted to experience in Kant's uh, prize essay uh, and the ways in which um, Kant reads Wolf. And also um, the ways in which we can um, uh, um, situate Kant with respect to uh, Newton um, and to Bacon. Um, the next chapter here uh, by Clinton Tolley and Brian Truss is devoted to Tatans um, and basically mainly to Tatans' um, Philosophische Versuche. Um, and uh, uh, the two authors uh, consider his views um, on the philosopher experience uh, of the cognitive activities carried out by the human mind themselves and uh, conclude the chapter by comparing Tatans and Kant. In the final chapter, Karin um, traces Kant's successive attempts to come to terms with the role of experience in metaphysics, in the inquiry, in the dreams of a spirit seer, and finally in the critique of the pure reason. And um, she argues that Kant's successive efforts to solve this tension uh, culminate, culminated in Kant's claim put forward in the critique that the synthetic a prior recognition to which metaphysics um, aspired is warranted only insofar as it pertains to possible experience. So these are the four um, sections of the, of the volume. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that brief interview. And I will pass the floor over to our first speaker. So Matteo, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to your talk, your commentary. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, Karin and Tinka for giving me the opportunity to read and now to discuss uh, this fascinating volume. And I begin with a, a general question that will be the main focus of my talk, and namely, what was the role of Christian Wolf in this uh, experiential turn? The book addresses this issue in several chapters and from different points of view, but in spite of the differences, it seems to me that the authors give agree in positively evaluating Wolf's role and thus in recognizing the importance of Wolf's contribution uh, to the 18th century debate on experience. As is well known, this issue is very controversial. Both attitude towards experience and empirical knowledge has been interpreted in very different manners and sometimes in even in diametrically opposed terms. Wolf has been described as a purely rationalist philosopher who builds a, an a priori system starting from nominal definitions, but also an, as an experimental philosopher who develops a an epistemology of experiment and uh, a posteriori knowledge. A limit, in my view, of the traditional approach to the issue was the pretension to give a simple, straightforward answer to a complex question. For instance, scholars have often failed to distinguish between Wolf, Wolf's explicit methodology, that is the scientific procedures that he he expressly prescribed, and his actual epistemic practice. Furthermore, Wolf's work has been often considered as a monolith by overlooking its internal development and without investigating the different context of his different works. And the result was to sweep under the carpet the changes and turns that are present in Wolf's intellectual trajectory. So this is the first reason to praise Christian Leduc's chapter for addressing the issue of Wolf's role in the experiential turn 
without concealing the complexity of the work. On the contrary, Leduc uses this issue precisely to highlight the evolution of Wolf's thought. Leduc focuses on the discipline that Wolf calls general cosmology, which is the part of metaphysics that investigates the, the most general properties of the physical world. Wolf provided two distinct expositions of the general doctrine of the world. The first one in 1720, in the fourth chapter of the German metaphysics, and the second one 11 years later in the Latin Cosmologia Generalis, 1731. In Wolf's system, the position of each discipline is defined by its role with respect to the other disciplines. So on the one hand, general cosmology is based on ontology and specifically on the ontolo ontological doctrine of composite being. On the other hand, cos general cosmology provides the foundations of physics. Thus, we may say that one of the roles of general cosmology is to bridge the gap between ontology and physics. That is between the very abstract concept of entity and the real bodies that populate our physical world. The question that Leduc poses is whether this empiric, this metaphysical consideration of the physical world is based also on our empirical acquaintance with the actual world. Wolf was not a purely speculative physicist. On the contrary, he was actively engaged in experimental physics. So does this experimental approach to the physical world somehow influence Wolf's development of general cosmology? Does experimental physics have implications for metaphysics? Of course, Wolf maintained that every philosophical discipline has an experimental or empirical side. Even ontology should include an experimental ontology. So general cosmology too must make room for experience, but how much room and for what purpose? According to Christian Leduc's interpretation, the answer that we give to such questions varies according to whether we consider the German cosmology of 1720, that is the cosmological chapter of the German metaphysics, or the Latin cosmologia generalis of 1731. His point is that, quote, the method Wolf employs in the German metaphysics hinges much more on experience than the one he employs in the cosmologia. So Leduc's idea is that in the 11 years that separate these two works, Wolf's position has evolved. Experience has lost at least part of the fundamental role it had in the German metaphysics. According to this reading, the old cliche of Wolf as a pure rationalist who tries to demonstrate every proposition a, pri a priority fits the Wolf of the Latin system a little better than it fits the Wolf of the German system. Although I am largely sympathetic to Christian Leduc's approach because I deem it very important to recognize the dynamic character of Wolf's thought. There are some issues that I would like to discuss. First, to make his point, uh, Christian Leduc develops two main arguments. The first one, quote, is that the German cosmology takes recourse to experience in a more substantial way. Many proofs are established on the basis of observation and experimentation, and in numerous sections, Wolf adduces everyday experience or scientific experiments to vindicate his views." End of quote. For instance, Leduc argues that in the German metaphysics, Wolf invokes empirical evidence to establish the law of inertia. In my view, this example is not conclusive for two reasons. First, experience appears to provide not so much a foundation of the law of inertia as a confirmation, 
an a posteriori confirmation of an already established law. And second, we can find something very similar also in the Latin cosmology, because after demonstrating the proposition that every body resists motion, Wolf adds an empirical confirmation with the formula in mundo aspectabili idem confirmatur a posteriori, that is, in the actual world, the same proposition is confirmed a posteriori. And the same formula or similar formulas occur several times in the Cosmologia, which so shows that first, experience does play a role also in the Latin cosmology, and second, that experience is always about the actual world alone. And this leads to Leduc's second argument. Quote, the chapter of German metaphysics is concerned with the physical world such as it is known through actual perceptions. Wolf did not necessarily believe that the treated cosmological principles were applicable to all possible worlds." End of quote. So this is this, according to Leduc, this is a difference, this makes a difference between German metaphysics and Latin cosmology. However, in the cosmological chapter of German metaphysics, Wolf formulates for the first time his doctrine of possible worlds. And it is this doctrine that makes general cosmology essential to natural theology. Because by establishing that other worlds are possible, Wolf can establish that this world is contingent, which provides a premise for demonstrating the existence of God. So I am inclined to think that the doctrine of possible worlds is an essential part of Wolf's project of general cosmology from the very beginning of this project and doesn't simply, it is not something that Wolf adds later. Of course, Christian Leduc acknowledges that experience is not absent from the Latin cosmology. He quotes a very interesting passage from paragraph five in which Wolf expresses his view on the relation between experimental cosmology and scientific cosmology. However, my reading of this passage is slightly different from Leduc's reading. In my reading, Wolf doesn't simply say that experimental cosmology improves our knowledge. Rather, he says that experimental cosmology, quote, can be cultivated before scientific cosmology and can be, can be combined with it. So in my view, Wolf's idea is that to some extent, it is possible to develop the experimental part and the rational part, so to speak, in parallel, without having to accomplish the theory before conducting experiments and collecting observations or the other way around. I think that Wolf never changed his mind on this possibility of parallel development of rational theory and experience, which in this way can provide support to each other. Nevertheless, I think that Leduc is certainly right in claiming that the Latin cosmology has a larger a priori foundation. The question is why? How can we explain this difference? If Wolf hasn't changed his mind concerning the mutual support between experience and reason, why does he give different weight to experience or reason in different contexts? One reason might be that the German metaphysics lacks a sufficient ontological foundation to make it possible to derive the propositions of general cosmology a, pri a priori. Wolf's recourse to experience instead of rational deduction would be a provisional solution later superseded by the development of the Latin system. Another reason might have to do with Wolf's biography. 
When Wolf writes the German metaphysics, he is still involved in experimental science and he's still writing about it. Later, when Wolf writes the Latin cosmology, he is no longer conducting ex experiments or writing handbooks of natural sciences. Wolf never completed his Latin system with a physics or a physiology. The task of complete, completing Wolf's Latin system by adding a natural philosophy of physics was assumed by a Wolfian, a Wolfian, Michael Christoph Hanov, who published four interesting volumes, which uh, he presented as a continuation of the Wolfian system. Uh, I mention Hanov because he appears in Alessandro Nannini's chapter as the author of a sketch of the art of invention, which may have been one of the sources of Baumgarten's theory of experience. Baumgarten is mostly known as the founder of aesthetics and as the author of a metaphysics which was adopted by Kant as a textbook in his lectures. Thus, the received picture of Baumgarten plays, pays little attention to his connection with the experimental tradition issued from the domain of natural sciences. And there, there has been a tendency to forget that Baumgarten, as Nannini reminds us, taught not only aesthetics, but also physics. By contrast, Nannini convincingly argues that Baumgarten's aesthetics, and especially what Baumgarten called the aesthetic art of experience, or aesthetic empirics should be read in the context of early modern experimentalism, which includes both scientific experimentalism and theological experimentalism. According to Nannini, Baumgarten's link between aesthetics and experimentalism is paramount to his philosophical project and could be described as a two-way or mutual foundation. On the one hand, aesthetics provides a philosophical foundation of experimentalism. On the other hand, aesthetics is so much tied to experience that, is, that it is itself an experimental discipline. In my opinion, what still remains a bit elusive in this reading of Baumgarten's aesthetics is the problem of the sources of his project. Nanini's chapter is successful in widening the usual references so as to include several neglected sources belonging to the experimental tradition. But at the end of the day, it is difficult to have a clear picture of this tradition. For once again, we have to do with the problem of disentangling Leibniz's influence from Wolf's influence, the Wolfians or the so-called so Wolfians from Wolf and so on. For instance, I have mentioned Nannini's reference to Hanov. How much, uh, how, mu how much of what Hanov says about the reliability of experience and testimony is original and how much comes from Wolf's epistemology? Another case in, in point is Baumgarten's treatment of sense deception in his Metaphysica, which Nanini describes as part of the aesthetic project of grounding the reliability of sensory experience. Baumgarten maintains that sensations in themselves cannot be false. If they deceive, if they deceive us, it is only because we infer wrong judgments from true sensations. Nanini is certainly right in stressing the importance of this idea that sense perceptions are basically innocent, for they are always veridical. My question is, where does this idea come from? Nanini uses the example of the square tower that appears round if seen from a distance. As far as I know, this example doesn't appear in Baumgarten, but in Leibniz. So my question is, is Nanini suggesting that Baumgarten's account of sense deception 
is Leibnizian? This sounds very plausible to me, but then I find it difficult to ascribe Baumgarten's account to the experimental tradition. So the question could be formulated as follows. How can we combine the Leibnizian inspiration of Baumgarten's epistemology with the empirical or experimental strand of his aesthetics? The chapter by Anneli Grosse is devoted to another protagonist of the Wolfian scene, Jean-Henri Samuel Formé, and in particular to the role of reason, experience, and physiology in Formé's essay on dreams. At first sight, the choice of this subject may appear odd. What have dreams to do with experience and reason? In fact, this chapter shows that the investigation of dreams and the effort to provide a scientific explanation for this phenomenon were a sort of test bed for the newborn discipline of empirical psychology. The author argues that the essay on dreams stands out from other works by Forme in that it emphasizes the reliability and not the flows of sensory experience. According to the author, this empiricist attitude was part of a rhetorical strategy designed to make Wolfian ideas more palatable to the members of the Berlin Academy. So on the one hand, Anneli Grosse highlights the Wolfian inspiration of the essay on dreams. She writes, quote, the, methodolo the methodological procedure employed in Forme's essay on dreams corresponds to Wolf's account of how to establish knowledge in general and empirical knowledge in particular, end of quote. On the other hand, she stresses the originality of Forme with respect, with respect to his Wolfian sources. Concerning this second issue, I am not entirely convinced of the differences that she finds between Forme and Wolf. Her main point is that Forme sought to integrate, quote, to integrate metaphysics and natural philosophy, end of quote, thus overcoming the Wolfian separation of physiological and metaphysical investigations of the human soul. For according to Grosse, quote, Wolf investigated the nervous system in his natural philosophy and the mental faculties in his metaphysics. So whereas Wolf provides only metaphysical explanations, for May provides also physiological explanations and thus he approaches the phenomenon of dreaming, uh, quote, from a completely different angle, end of quote. In my opinion, a limit of this assessment is that it considers only Wolf's account of dreams in the German metaphysics. But if we take a look at Latin works and especially at the um, Psychologia Rationalis, we find a theory of dreams which is based on physiological principles, a theory that carefully explains how the state of the dreaming soul corresponds to a certain state of the brain. According to Wolf, every mental process has a corresponding physical process in the brain. And the rational psychology shows that Wolf before for May, for May, had already integrated the physiology of the nervous system into the metaphysics of the soul. So one might conclude that uh, in this perspective, both Latin works are more empirically founded than his German works, contrary to what we have seen in the case of the general cosmology. But I would resist even this conclusion. For my further question is, why should we assume that 
physiological explanations are more empirical or more evidence-based than metaphysical reasonings. The physiological, the, the physiological model of the brain and nervous system that we find in both Wolf and Forme is largely hypothetical. It derives more from Cartesian speculative physiology than from an empirical observation of the inner working, workings of the brain. So I am rather reluctant to equate physiological with empirical. From the Wolfian point of view, the theory of dreams that Forme develops in his essay belongs rather to rational psychology than to empirical psychology. So this was my last uh, question for the author. And uh, I like also to thank very much the author for accepting to discuss their work with me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. And we have our authors, our just mentioned authors here today. So we have Christian Leduc, Alessandro Nanini, and Anneli Grosse. Thank you very much for joining us. You now have 15 minutes um, for a response. Um, it's up to you how you organize it. You can take it in turn. It works out, I guess, to five minutes per person. Um, I will ask you to try to keep it within the 15 minute uh, limit because I think some people have to go and if there are any unresolved issues we can take them up either in the Q&A at the end or in the informal discussion after. Okay, so the floor is yours collectively. Well, since uh, since Matthew began with, with my chapter, I can start, is that okay? Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot, Matteo. It's not it's not the first time we have a discussion about our, our respective works, and I I truly appreciate your uh, your um, your uh, your examination and uh, of course your knowledge of Wall's uh, Wall's work and Wall's philosophy. Um, very briefly, I would just like to answer three. Uh, concerns or, or issues that you find in, in my uh, chapter. And I think, as it is often the case, that we agree more than what you suggested in your, in your comment. Um, so first, on, on the idea that um, there would be an evolution in Paul's uh, thoughts about experience, about the role of experience, um, I'm not clear about this point neither, and, and I think that my contribution is more modest. I just wanted to emphasize two ways uh, of, of dealing with experience in Wolf's uh, philosophy, one in the German metaphysics and one in the Cosmologia Generalis. Um, and I don't remember maintaining that there is an ev evolution uh, in this regard, but simply that uh, there are two actually parallel ways, as you mentioned, and I think it's very, it's very, uh, it's very clear that two parallel ways to discover truths. So either to experience uh, or the other to a priori and scientific means. Um, so on this point, I'm, I'm, I was just emphasizing that on all these about these debates about. Uh, the role of experience in the Wolf, uh, for example, uh, uh, what's his name, his name again, Vanzo, um, uh, Alberto Vanzo uh, maintain, I think, something very too, too strong, saying that Wolf is, a, is, is uh, mainly an experimental philosopher That's, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't fit some, some important passages. So second, um, your interpretation of experience in the German, I would, I would disagree with your interpretation of experience in the German metaphysics. When you say that uh, in the case of inertia, but we could take I, uh, other example that I gave in the chapter, for example, is proof of the gas pressure, that experience is just confirming what was demonstrated, let's say a priori to other means. Uh, to my view, in the German metaphysics, it, these are complementary proofs, not simply 
uh, the rational proof is not doesn't necessarily come before or is not uh, more complete than the experimental proof. Uh, maybe my my analysis of, of uh, the law of inertia was not convincing enough, but I think in the case of impulse or the case of gas pressure, it is clearly uh, it is clear to my view that um, Wolf is needs experience uh, to uh, to prove his point, not simply confirming what was already demonstrated before. Um, and I, I would say that what he says of experience in the Cosmologia Generalis is exactly what you said about the German methods, that it is that the role of experience in the Cosmologia is to confirm what was demonstrated before because his method is, is different. And once again, these two parallel ways that he calls scientific and experimental, um, I think could also be, and that's that's one of my conclusions, could be associated to two methods that both identifies in his logica. So a method of discovery and a method of exposition. And I think in the cosmologia, as it is the case in other Latin work, he's using a method of exposition, a, a systematic method, while in the German metaphysics, he's integrating more elements of the method of, of discovery. And lastly, and I'll end up uh, and with this point about possible worlds in the German metaphysics, in the German cosmologia, I don't see that this is inco incompatible with a project that is focusing, mainly focusing on the actual world, which, uh, which um, um, uh, uh, use uh, in a more uh, in a more productive way, experience that it is the case in cosmologia. So you can have a proof of possible worlds of contingency and still trying to have a metaphysics of nature that is mainly uh, uh, oriented toward the actual world. So I'm not saying that there's nothing about the essence of of the world. I think in my chapter uh, in the German cosmologia, but uh, cosmology, but simply that. Uh, Wolf's main focus was uh, the actual world. So I don't want that. So thanks again for, for your comment. Uh, and uh, yeah, great. I'll stop here. Okay, thanks very much for that, Christian. Perhaps we can come back to this point in the Q&A or informal discussion and move to Alessandro Nanini. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this, uh, for your reading. Uh, and and um, um, so, um, yeah, my attempt was in, in, indeed to, to take into account a wider range of sources uh, for Baumgarten, especially from the, from the experimental point of view, which uh, was uh, actually neglected with regard to other uh, contexts. Uh, in the case of Hanov, I would like to say that my attempt was not really to prove a direct um, influence on Baumgarten, but rather to see that there was uh, indeed uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this moment an interest to find uh, li um, laws of sensibility. And it is interesting about Hanov that he does not only uh, provide laws of sensibility uh, for external senses, but also, as you also mentioned, uh, for like a kind of experimental theology. So how can we uh, prove that for example, a sensation comes from God, the Holy Spirit, which criteria are going to be respected. So I, I was interested because kind of, uh, one or two years before Baumgarten, um, from uh, a position that is not uh, actually yet Wolfian, so Hanov in the, at the end of the 30s is still rather independent from Wolf. Um, but in any case, it is in the middle of the debate. So I wanted to, to, to just suggest that Baumgarten may have, but without any um, necessary evidence, uh, taken this these, uh, these, uh, uh, interest in this kind of, of discussion and, uh, see, and could have also seen the importance of aesthetics to solve or to found this kind of, um, uh, this kind of problem. Um, so yeah, I think that experimentalism is important insofar as it is about 
uh, both the theoretical foundation of sensation, so how much uh, did experimentalism contribute before Baumgarten to uh, find some possible laws of, uh, of sensation, both yeah, in, in the scientific and in the theological realm, and how much did this uh, approach, experimental approach, uh, contribute to uh, perfecting also from a practical point of view of, of, of sensibility and in this case of the senses, because these are the two topics that Baumgarten wants to take for its um, aesthetic empirics or empirical aesthetics. Um, it is very interesting, the example of the tower and, and, and the, the possible Leibnizian um, let's say influence, I would say that these, uh, the, the, the problem of fallacies and the fact that the sensations are or, or not innocent comes from the Aristotelian tradition and the Avicennian tradition. So the, the tradition of the vis estimativa. So we have uh, like a nice thesis in Baumgarten that is judging. And this is very different, for example, from Kant. But an anesthetist an that is judging doesn't mean that the senses judge themselves, but that the inference is um, framed within the analogon rationis, which is the, uh, let's say, the possibility of inference attributed to aesthetics. So I would agree that it is also Leibnizian because of course, also Leibniz, of course, Leibniz is um, important for the, uh, let's say, um, analog the, the, the development of this possibility of a reasoning that is not situated within reason itself, but it is analog to reason, and it is important for Baumgarten. But I think that, yeah, this kind of hygiene, but not in the senses itself, can also have like roots in um, in, an, in a more ancient tradition. And it is in, in any case very interesting to, to, to disentangle how Baumgarten is able to um, put together the Leibnizian tradition, which is so important in other contexts of, um, let's say, um, na uh, nature of philosophy influences. For example, in the context of this diva that Baumgarten uses in his aesthetics, um, and the experimental, let's say, the, the English tradition. For example, Boyle, Baumgarten uh, admired Boyle, and uh, my uh, suggestion is that he could have also used Boyle's uh, essay on the unsuccessfulness of experiments in order to bring this uh, kind of experimentalism to a psychological point of view through the mediation of Hagen, who was uh, the main author, let's say, in the early Wolfian um, tradition that tried to apply a kind of experimental uh, psychology. Baumgarten would like in his aesthetics to, to use or to adapt this kind of um, psychology to his own aims, let's say, uh, so aesthetic aims. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much for that. And Anneli Grosse. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot, Matteo Favaretti, for your comments and also um, for pointing to the, the differences between uh, the German metaphysics and um, the um, Psicologia Rationalis uh, of Wolf and uh, as um, two different um, possible sources for Forme. Um, I concentrated on, the, on um, Forme's reception of the German metaphysics um, because of um, the context or the history of the emergence of his um, article um, just at the same time or the essay um, on dreams uh, because he um, worked with the German metaphysics at this time, which I could um, um, yeah, find out. And um, this is why I assumed that this was his uh, main source, but of course um, it might be um, helpful to also uh, compare it to to what's um, earlier um, empirical uh, rational psychology compared to for May's essay on dreams. I um, find uh, very interesting uh, your your final question or your comment on um, the question why we assume that uh, physiological uh, 
knowledge is uh, more should be considered more empirical than um, a priori reasoning or a theory building and um, this is indeed um, uh, as you mentioned it um, might be doubted um, but um, I see it um, in for me it's um, it's a way of, of framing it also um, this uh, the use of this uh, physiological uh, knowledge which he in, in certain uh, aspects is, um, let's say it's uh, like this, he is um, using it in his um, chain of arguments. He is using physiological knowledge in, um, in different means. So there is uh, at one point, one could say he, he uses, it as, uses it more as an um, uh, a priori uh, theory or principle when he um, explains uh, the, um, uh, the emergence of a sensation through the the um, nerve uh, which is shaken and uh, which he poses as a principle um, this is correct uh, rather than as an um, as empirical or experimental material from which he in uh, induces um, a principle uh, but then on other positions or on other points of his essay, he is then using also physiological descriptions as his, um, let's say, historical uh, facts or source material um, of, for um, establishing theories or for um, using it as uh, touchstones for um, theory, existing theories. Um, like, for example, when he is um, uh, using uh, the um, when he is trying to account for the, um, uh, the, the state when dreaming is uh, kicking in with the, the mediocre um, state of, um, of the person who um, is sleeping. And then he uses the theory of, um, of animal spirits and um, they, are, that they neither have to be abundant or, um, or too low. And um, so he uh, uses this, in my view, as a um, as a kind of um, empirical um, or um, yeah empirical um, account uh, for this um, observation he uh, makes um, and the theory he establishes from it in, in order yeah which is in order to dream uh, you have to be in a mediocre state of um, um, body and mind. Um, yeah. So um, saying this, um, I would say, um, yeah, that um, he is, of course, mixing in a certain way for me, um, or this was my impression when, when reading um, or when analyzing the um, essay on dreams. Um, he is uh, mixing the, the epistemological uh, um, uh, way of, of doing, uh, of um, accounting for um, empirical uh, knowledge with um, the use of um, yeah, what we might call a natural science or physiological uh, explana explanations. And he is, um, or it appears in, in the reading and analyzing of this text that he is kind of uh, equating uh, this um, uh, natural scientific knowledge, if we want to uh, phrase it like this or very uh, broadly, uh, with empirical method, which I assume is, uh, is of course due that it is also already at this time um, and among his colleagues also at the academy associated with each other. Yeah. So thanks again, Matteo, for your comments. And um, yeah, I give the word to Pavel again. Okay, thanks very much for that, everybody. So some um, very interesting points to take up in our Q&A and in our discussion. Um, but before we do that, um, let's move directly to our second speaker. Before we do that, actually, we have a short break scheduled. Um, I'm going to shorten it even more because we're a few minutes behind. So let's say two minutes. Um, it is now, well, depending on your time zone, it's um, 5.02 or 6.02 or two minutes past the hour. So should we say we meet back at five minutes past um, and then we'll continue with Ursula Goldman's contribution? Continue. Okay, so I now turn the floor over to Ursula Goldman. Thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to your comments. I 
think you're muted. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Sure, if I can satisfy your expectations. But I have to say in the very beginning that I'm very glad that there's so much more interest to the pre Kantian philosophy in our days than it has been like 30 years ago. And, you know, there was another volume of uh, Paula Romora and um, Passini on the other side of Germany. There's a volume of Pelletier on uh, experience in Leibniz. And there's also a lot of research about Wolf being much more interested in experimental stuff than has been um, assumed in the past. But um, when we heard in the introduction that this volume is kind of taking on all these traditional prejudices about German philosophy before Kant, it is actually arguing against something that has been invented by Kant, namely the idea that there is empiricism and there is rationalism and the ones underestimate reason and the ones underestimate experience and therefore he is bridging the whole thing and that is how the new philosophy started and this has been continued by Hegel and Hegelian history of philosophy has been canonized until our days so in that respect we are kind of dealing with some uh, prejudices which have been invented by Kant himself because as the first section of the volume shows about Wolfianism and experience and experiment, there was much more and much more thoughtful on experience already in rationalism than it has been assumed by Kant. So in that respect, I'm very happy that you did this volume and uh, to question all these prejudices. And I'm especially happy that you included not just those who changed toward experience in particular, but that you also included Wolf and Wolfians, particularly journals. So that is a very good move because that is usually just put on the side of rationalism and nobody looks for experience in them. So that is a very good move. I congratulate you explicitly to that. And then I have to say I'm less satisfied with your order of things, namely that all these different authors you discuss in your chapters are put together as just a variety of different approaches. In my view, it is very easy to see that they all belong to one or the other camp, namely to rationalists or to empiricists. And the difference is, am I interested in experience in order to uh, do science and to find natural explanations of everything? Or am I aiming for experience in order to limit reasoning? It is a very different intention. And I think that empiricism is not so much interested in experience per se, but rather an experience as limiting reason. And rationalists have always been interested in experience, particularly they developed a much more sophisticated concept of experience, namely as experiment, bringing reasoning and experimenting together by hypothesis and experiment shaped according to the hypothesis in order to check things as they are in the real world. And you will not find such a notion in empiricists as not as far as I read them. So, and then there's another aspect which I will stress a little bit in the different um, uh, steps. There's a lot of theological intention in the empiricist camp. So all of these authors which are discussed in the chapters, I will 
uh, present on are closely related to theological intentions. To make um, experience strong, particularly inner experience, but also other experience in order to show, and that is one of the quotes from Newton, which are most often quoted by almost every writing theologian in Germany, at least among Protestant theologians, namely that we can know things by experience which we will never ever know by essence. Just as Newton showed that we know gravity by experience, but we will never know the cause of gravity. He has been proven wrong by the meantime, but in the meantime, but nonetheless, this quote I found even in the discussion about Lessing's Fragmentenstreit. It is everywhere. Theologians were so happy about Newton in that respect. Okay, so I come uh, to the uh, major points um, to the to the chapters. The Thomasians were that is a chapter which covers a lot of people and a lot of time. It starts with Thomasius at the end of the 17th century and it ends with the discussion of uh, Crucius. And so it is very hard uh, to give a detailed discussion of it. And also it includes theologians like Bode and Spurius as well as um, a physicist as Rüdiger. And so I rather want to raise some general questions. Clear is the opposition again uh, of Thomasius uh, and his disciples to Wolf and to Leibniz. So you have again two camps, as I just claimed. And it is also clear that there's a theological issue involved. If I just give an example, one of uh, the Thomasians, that is um, Adolf Hoffmann, um, he was one of the major collaborator of the theologian Joachim Lange in defeating the Wolfian who translated the Wertham Bible. So he has not just one, but a few counter writings against this Wolfian, which was clearly theologically interested. Um, but just to say there is a clear opposition between the Thomasians and um, his disciples to Wolf and Leibniz, but as the author points out correctly, they all agree that we need both experience and reason, at least at the first glance. They also agree that experience does not provide certainty of knowledge. So there's no disagreement about that. And third, that they all agree that it does not provide, that experience does not provide causal explanation. Experience per se cannot provide that. Both though, ask for experience in order to support reason and reality knowledge and knowledge of causes. So he is interested in causal explanation, but he only wants to provide it by bringing reasoning or demonstrative knowledge together with experience or rather with experiment. Mm -hmm. And that means that reason has to show what is possible. And then one has to look what might happen, in fact, in reality. And Wolf suggests rational hypothesis in this sense, and then experiments to unite reason and senses. So it is a reason-led experience in Wolf. I could not more agree with the author when he says that Wolf um, is, or, I just skip this, sorry. Um, the author says that Tomasus goes beyond Bacon and Locke in his approach 
to experience, although he doesn't show that in any part of the chapter. But I would rather claim that Wolf is much closer to Bacon's approach than uh, his empiricist opponents among the Tomasians. So then the second point is the emphasis on inner experience. And this is, of course, indispensable for Christian theologians. There's so no surprise that Buddha and Serbius, the theologians among the Tomasians, which are discussed, openly uh, are in favor of uh, the theological use of inner experience as an argument. And even if Cruzus does not be explicit about that, I mean, the application for theology, he is still very interested in this inner experience. And I want to point uh, to the role of this inner experience for theology by pointing to the Sailor's universal lexicon or universal lexicon. And there you have an interesting division of labor. There's one article, both very long articles. One article is on experience. And that article, uh, the other article is about experiment. And you can guess which article is written by Bode or Walsh, his son-in-law, and which article is written by a Wolfian. It is super obvious when you read the articles, you don't even need to read the author. So the experiment article has to do with scientific experience as we understand it still today, even if it is more sophisticated today in, in its exact uh, uh, understanding, but nonetheless, that is what you already have involved. But you don't have any such thing in the article on experience by the theologian. But you have everything about inner experience. So um, I want to uh, conclude that if you look through all these uh, Tumasians, beside their uh, understanding of experience in general. If you look at Rüdiger, Rüdiger is a, a physicist or a doctor, and he is very specific about how sense perception, sensation, and sensio are distinguished. And I cannot really see how he is interested in any support uh, of of this kind of complex notion of experience by reasoning. So that is the, actually the major difference between the two camps in that respect. So I want to turn to Jan Kant and to the chapter of uh, Courtney Fugate. I perfectly agree with the major thesis um, that Kant was not a Wolfian in his price shrift. And I couldn't even more agree because in my opinion, Kant has never been a Wolfian. And I showed that already for his very first writing and that will come up, come out next uh, month in, at Oxford University Press in a volume on Kant and Leibniz where questions like these will play a role as well. Already his Kant's work on the estimation of forces has nothing to do with Wolf, although he uses Wolfian terminology all the time as do all the philosophers in the 18th century in Germany. Because Wolf was so prevailing and he was a systematic thinker and it was easy to have analogous uh, theories which were structured similarly to Wolf but would still make a different argument. So um, I'm not so sure whether Kant is very close to Bacon as the author claims, but surely Newton is very much in the picture. But then I want to ask, which Newton? To be sure, Wolf and even more Leibniz greatly admired Newton, even if they criticized his metaphysics. And they both studied his work thoroughly. 
the students of Leibniz, the Bernoullis in Basel, even brought Leibniz uh, terminology and signification together with Newton's uh, calculus. They were all capable to do so because they knew the calculus. And they had it available, they knew Kepler and they knew Galileo. And what did Kant know of Newton? Of his mathematical principles of natural philosophy? Not much. He had a very bad access to mathematics in Königsberg. And so he couldn't, he couldn't really study. The highest level Kant ever reached in mathematics was Wolf's beginner book on mathematics. So I already mentioned that no um, quote of Newton, the quote of Newton, which has uh, cited so often by theologians. And there's a very interesting study, uh, not study, um, series of articles over five years in a theological journal in Germany that has a very long title as all these journals. Früh uh, aufgelesene Früchte, etc., etc. And that is a, a letter to the evangelical youth of Germany. And there, the author, and that is the leader of the uh, church, of the Protestant church in Saxony, writes to this youth, the academic youth of the Protestant states, that they should forget about mechanical philosophy, but they should embrace modern science, uh, which is organized in the way it is by Newton and by Robert Boyle. So he is all in favor of modern science if it is done in this empiricist way as Boyle and Newton do it. And he is full of hatred against Leibniz and Wolf. And why so? Because of the threat of pre-established harmony for free will, because of the secular uh, foundation of morals on a natural striving for perfection because of the best of all possible worlds, because that contradicts the um, valley of misery, which our world is considered to be by theologians. And there's uh, also the whole discussion about experience. So, um, The whole question when modern science started with Galileo was on the one hand that only science could provide demonstrations for truth, for true sentences. And theology had no such demonstrations available. And that is the reason why they looked for different sources of knowledge and experience was just the, the right thing to have because we know religious truth by experience, by history. And the other thing is that since Galileo, we have the mind body problem. And I will come to that in the last section of my paper. Um, but the argument about the first point is we can know theological truth just as certain although not absolutely certain as in mathematics, but as certain as Newton knew is physical truth by experience. And this is justification enough to trust on religious faith. Okay, so um, I don't see in, in this kind of approach any striving for experience in, this, in the true sense, you know, as we understand it today. Okay, so I turn to the last point, and that is materialism, or uh, what Falk Wunderlich is uh, addressing as materialism. I don't see it as materialism in the true sense. So neither Miners nor Hisman 
I can see in a different light. I think they have both very strong theological motives for developing their philosophical approach. So we are now in a very different time period that is the 70s of the 18th century. And in my eyes, the materialism of him in his psychological attempts reduces to one statement, and that is, the soul is material. And the entire long-winded essay lacks any convincing argument that that is so, except gesturing to uh, a variety of examples reported by doctors about brain damage, just as materialists today are doing. So, What I think what he intended to accomplish by such a meager argument, which still fills hundreds of pages of his psychological attempts, comes to a very short summary on page 267, at least in that first edition. He admits that the many efforts of theologies and uh, theologians and philosophers to secure an influx physicus between soul and body has failed and will come to nothing. And in that respect, he has a higher um, esteem or he holds Leibniz in a higher regard than influxus for, uh, theologians or philosophers because he is a kind of monist and doesn't get into the troubles to show how the soul influences the body or the body the soul. But he just goes to the other side and makes the soul a body. Not quite so, though, because when he is asked or he, if he is checked very strictly, you can see that it is about subtle matter not matter per se, not matter like a, our body. And that is an idea which came already up, for example, by the Cambridge Platonists. And it has already been in the, uh, with the Plato, the Cambridge Platonists being directed against Descartes and against his um, inability to explain how the soul can um, influence the body and how the body can influence the soul. And that would rule out free will, to be sure, free will in the sense of lib liberum arbitrium. And that is the reason why uh, Cutworth and Henry Moore, interesting the exchange between Moore and Descartes about it, uh, already started to think about just making the soul more material, then the whole problem would be solved. Um, but the question is still for uh, miners and um, moreover Hisman, the chapter is mostly about Hisman, um, how we could secure immortality of the soul if it is about uh, a material soul, because as we all know, our body falls apart after death, that has never been doubted. So how could the soul survive with, uh, with um, then being material? And I didn't find an explicit answer. I'm not so close, and that would be a question uh, to Falk Wunderlich. If there is any such answer, perhaps a subtle matter, but he clearly kind of gestures to something every Christian can be totally sure of, and that is the promise of Jesus Christ. And when I realized that, I wondered, 
that when he wrote in 77, and I remember that Miners even wrote a review of a book that came out in 7071. And that is Moses Mendelssohn's rational demonstration of the immortality of the soul. This book had been a bestseller and it had also an effect like a bomb in the intellectual world. If you look at the number of reviews, Europe wide, because that was a huge challenge to Christianity that a Jew would just demonstrate that a Jew could reach immortality of the soul by mere reason, not needing any promise of Jesus Christ. To be sure, Menelun had written the Phaedon just because of the many attempts to convert him by Christian theologians. And the argument has been in all these cases that he would miss immortality if he wouldn't convert. And that is why he wrote the book in the first place. And then he showed to the Christian that he could actually do without. And I think that was really a challenge and that is why they had to respond to it. And I think I read Hisman's psychological attempts as a response to this kind of rationalist approach, but not only rationalist, but also this Jewish approach to immortality that had to be rejected. So perhaps I have given much more context than you need, but I would at least want to have a little bit more context from approaches to this early German philosophy before Kant. So I hope that we can both move in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for those comments, questions, and challenges. Um, I'm now going to solicit some responses from our authors. Unfortunately, it looks like we've lost one of our authors due to technical reasons, but we still have Courtney Fugate and Falk Wunderlich, it looks like. So perhaps we can begin with Courtney Fugate. Uh, uh, hello, thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you, Ursula. It's great to see you again. Um, good to see you're doing well. Um, so uh, thanks for your comments on my chapter. They were rather brief, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to open them up a little bit and see if I can. Um, I'm, you know, I'm glad that you agree with me. Um, I think you would agree that um, that position is, is not the current state of the understanding in our field, as far as I can tell. Um, just for instance, the, the most recent book, you know, this, uh, uh, The Poverty of Conceptual Truth, um, kind of, you know, that, that's a book that supports the idea that Kant is almost essentially a Wolfian, um, right up until the critical period, right? So, um, and I would, I mean, what I was trying to do in part of the paper was to understand why, or at least try to tear down some of the obvious reasons why, um, you know, otherwise great scholars like Friedman and others are so compelled to make Kant into a Wolfian um, throughout the period and, and what that is. And that was kind of the reason that I, I included more about perhaps Bacon than about Newton was not to, to claim that Kant is closer to Bacon, but to try to show that Bacon wasn't read as a kind of radical empiricist in Kant's circles, right? That it, it did offer a different uh, 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 approach to Leibniz and was associated more with Newton, but that things like synthesis were not anathema to, uh, to, to uh, Bacon, right? It, he didn't tear down uh, the, the, the metaphysics so much as he made metaphysics limited, which I think you said very excellently there, that the, the, the key idea is how experience places limits on what metaphysical principles can do. And in particular, it kind of changes the origin of certainty in knowledge and locates it from demonstration to, ex, to experimental confirmation and so on, right? Um, so, uh, okay, um, I, I'm, I think we more or less agree there, maybe some fine things. Um, then you said something about which Newton. Um, in doing this, in writing this paper, uh, 
I did a lot of research on, on this very question. Um, and Karen and Tinka um, very uh, reasonably made me cut that out um, because the paper was just not, not rationally long. It was a, a length. So um, that's a, a part, of, part of the whole story, right? That's, a, that's an excellent question. What is the, uh, what, how would Kant have seen Newton? And of course, the, the standard interpretations that we've seen actually make us assume that he thought Newton was the same as Wolf, because he says his method is Newtonian, and they say the method is essentially a kind of a renewed Cartesian method is what Kant is offering in the prize essay. So that would be strange. So uh, I looked at a lot of the continental um, representations, all, in fact, all the things that Kant likely would have read um, that would refer to Newton. Um, and I think it boils down to, um, there were lots of summaries in Gravesand and other writers that wrote in Latin um, as well, and Kant, no, we know, referred to them, that presented essentially Newtonian, the Newtonian method, right, as presented at the end of the principles. And that is the core. But interestingly, the last thing you said is, um, it's stronger, you said that the theological um, Many argue that theological truths could be as certain as scientific truths, but uh, someone like Gravesand places induction within a theological framework because he argues that the reason Newton's method, or at least he presents it, Newton's method is secure because we can assume based upon the creation of the world by God that nature will be simple and uniform. And so that is kind of the ultimate methodological foundation, even of the Newtonian method as often presented on the continent, as far as I could tell. Um, so this is what I think, I think uh, if Kant is Newtonian, you know, in the, in the prize essay, it is precisely in this emphasis on the limitation that experience places upon fundamental metaphysical principles. Now, to me, it's unclear, and maybe you could offer an opinion on this, but it's unclear exactly when Kant appeals to inner experience. It's clear that later, you know, like in the, uh, in the dreams essay, um, that he's definitely appealing to some empir something empirical, something that must be given internally to us, right? Um, but I've had some pushback on that, whether in the prize essay already, that's his view. I argued that that's his view because that's how he seems to proceed in the only possible argument and in other things of the period. So whether you agree with that or not would be interesting to me. Um, that's, that's all I could think of. So thank you. May I just add one point I forgot. Uh, do you know the book of Waschkis? It's a super thick German book. Hans Joachim Waschkis on the young Kant. Um, and he has a long chapter about Newtonianism yeah. in Germany and what yeah. is available, et cetera. So that is what I highly recommend. He is not so present at conferences, et cetera, but that is a really great book. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Ursula, can you maybe put uh, put the title in the chest because I could not hear it very well. Um, how, how do I do that? I'm not so experienced with this system. <laughs> well, never mind. Then, then uh... in the chat, you mean? Okay, yes. and I can do that, but I do it a little bit later. Yeah. Yes. No problem. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. And um, we move to Falk Wunderlich. Hello, um, and thank you very much for um, taking the time to uh, comment on my uh, paper as well. Um, you've raised a lot of points and I'm trying to um, sort out a bit what I can uh, address here. Um, so first about what you call the theological motivation of uh, gutting philosophers that is not so easy to determine for a variety of reasons uh, one of them is that they are really acting in public that is they are not published they're, they're not uh, circulating clandestine manuscripts and that so they are in a way under uh, observation and may not be able to really speak out on every occasion. That is one aspect, even though it's not as dangerous in the 1770s uh, as in uh, 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 the, maybe the 17th century or earlier, but still. 
So, uh, and that's why we have to look for, uh, um, carefully look for uh, little traces about uh, the theological opinions they really had. So one of them is, uh, uh, a bit, bit known uh, by now, uh, Hisman in a letter to uh, relatively close but still uh, uh, theology-based uh, friend, uh, sound or, or uh, wants to sound like a Socinian. So he says something like, uh, so "If if you are a Christian, then Socinianism is the best way to be." But then uh, in his uh, in, in his month's uh, review of uh, Priestley's uh, disquisitions, so Priestley's main uh, main materialist work, uh, so, uh, his month has a very long uh, review of that that mostly just repeats what Priestley says with one exception, and that exception is Socinianism. And there his man argues, well, forget about that. That is an un unnecessary addition, which seems to show that Hisman wasn't seriously Socinian, but used that maybe to calm uh, 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 a theological friend and uh, didn't really mean it. We also have uh, uh, evidence from letters uh, Hisman wrote, uh, actually, or exchanged with Karl Franz von Irving, high church official. Where they both, uh, well, we don't have uh, many of, of his month's letters, but we know from uh, the right, uh, the, uh, we can tell from uh, Irving's uh, reactions uh, uh, what his man would be argued that they're both determinists. I know. Which is not very uh, easy to, uh, uh, which is difficult to seal, to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 get to terms with many parts of uh, theology. We also have uh, a letter by Mauvillon who sounds as if they were even, or he, he was at least uh, assuming that Hisman was even more radical in a kind of atheist sense, but that's a really, uh, also a letter that is uh, partly uh, has been destroyed. So. And we have this distinction between esoteric and exoteric uh, philosophy that Miners uh, makes, uh, goes uh, on uh, for quite a bit. Uh, so in exoteric philosophy, you have to obey what the church says. And in esoteric philosophy, you can speak up a bit more, but even then, if it's published uh, in a normal way and even not anonymously, um, that can become difficult. So uh, I don't see that uh, it's not uh, uh, easy to see what their theolo uh, theological standpoint really was. For Miners, Miners turned into conservative later, but he changed other opinions later as well. So uh, uh, if we concentrate on Hisman, um, he might not really be, or if he is a Christian, he would be a rather unorthodox one. Yeah. And um, so concerning immortality, the standard tool available for uh, materialists is, I mean, if they want to reconcile uh, immortality with materialism, is the one Priestley uh, takes. Uh, 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 so Priestley argues that um, the, uh, there is no there is no uh, no material soul for Priestley. The body decomposes and it's just gone, and God uh, at the uh, after uh, Judgment Day kind of reassembles uh, a new human being. And so, the same with the soul. Sorry. The same with the soul? No, there is no soul for Priestley. Oh, oh. The, so the, the, the mental states uh, are transferred by God. It's all, it all depends on grace, but it's not a natural event. So, and that's Priestley's case against uh, dualists. Dualists, or at least some, or, or most of them, or the Catholic ones, <laughs> 
uh, would tend to argue that you need the immaterial so to preserve the relevant uh, mental states to the next uh, uh, state of the human being. Priestley says that's unnecessary. And also, and, and that goes, uh, if you want, hand in hand with uh, the view that uh, a, a resurrection is purely grace and something outside of the of the rational discourse. It's something that we we don't understand, and that therefore we can also push away and, and not say much about. It. Well, Priestley says more about it, but he, because he, he is really a serious, theo a serious theologian, but that doesn't have to be uh, the case uh, for his man. Um, again, immortality of the soul, of course, comes up, or has to come up if, if someone uh, is a proclaimed materialist. It, it is just a natural question he would be asked by, uh, by others as well. But I don't think it uh, plays that much of a prominent role in the uh, Psychologische Versuche as it would if it really had a, theologic, uh, a larger theological uh, motivation. So he has to bring it up somehow to uh, not to get into trouble, but uh, it's not, oh, he, he makes it rather easy. And he, for instance, uh, comes up with, uh, with this Bonnet idea of uh, material germs uh, uh, just uh, surviving and so on. But he, he, it, it could be that way, and that's it. Okay. One uh, further point uh, is something you, you said at the beginning, that the true sense of materialism. I find that a bit difficult in uh, if we're looking at this uh, historically, because uh, at least since uh, La Métrie, the term materialism was used as an actor's category. It was used before as a, well, as an insult. So Hobbes and Spinoza and so on were called materialists, but mainly to, uh, uh, yeah, to criticize them. But that changed uh, around uh, the La Métrie time. And so this kind of uh, perspective that uh, concentrates on the human mind and on the explanation of the human mind um, is, uh, and, and the materialist version of it, is called by many of the contemporaries materialism. And that's a basic fact we have to deal with. And uh, of course, you can, and there are other forms of uh, materialism that extend beyond this question of uh, whether the human mind is material or uh, immaterial. Um, or in, uh, as John Yalton has put it, in fact, most of the debates that were, uh, that, that existed uh, based on uh, um, uh, uh, about uh, materialism were in fact based on Locke's suggestion rather than on Hobbes or Spinoza. And I think it's justified to use the term materialism for it because the people who did that used it themselves. So, yeah, um, I think that's, yeah, my five minutes will be over. Uh, anyway, thank you very much again for your questions. Okay, thanks everyone for that. So I can, I'm going to open the floor for questions, comments, uh, anything uh, to any of our speakers on any topic that um, um, has, that you've heard today. So if you want to um, say something or ask a question, just go ahead and use the raise hand function. Um, you can find it in the reactions. Or if you can't find it, you can type in the chat or let me know in some other way. So let's see. I see one hand up. Uh, it's Tinka. Thank you. Thank you very much for all these very interesting um, comments. Uh, I would like perhaps to ask Alessandro if he agrees uh, to uh, say a few words about the point mentioned by Ursula, uh, namely the, um, the relationship between the um, uh, theology and inner experience, the role of inner experience in theology, uh, and perhaps, uh, yes, the 
uh, different views that have rationalism and empiricism uh, regarding experience in theology as such. Um, I don't know if Alessandro um, can hear us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that, yes, I agree. In, in, I mean, in, in, the, in the history of Protestantism, the relationship between inner experience and, uh, and um, the senses inner experience and, and this kind of cognitio experimentalis dates back to Luther, I think, as far as I know. There is a, it is an interesting passage the, which is very much quoted, that is Philippe's one, one nine, in which there is the word eisthesis and Luther translates it into the word with the word erfarum. And uh, of course, uh, erfarum is experience. And, uh, and in this sense, there is a strong connection, according to me, and uh, between the, the like the uh, I, I think you're cutting out. I think. <laughs> I Alessandro, think, yes, we, we can't hear him. Maybe try turning off your camera because it's it's coming in um, broken. It might help if you turn off the ca camera. Ah, okay. Okay. Sounds better. Um, yeah, and, and as for the difference between, okay. And, and as for the difference between empiricism and rationalism, yeah. I, I remember, for example, um, uh, the writing about uh, the tolerance of religion uh, in religion by Leibniz, in which he is very suspicious of the use of experience in um, in religious matters, and um, uh, the letter to Pelisson, and um, and it is interesting that, for example, a rationalist author like Kant, Israel Israel Gottlieb Kant, in a very voluminous volume about the concordance between Wolfianism and, uh, and theology, he like follows up on this line and he is very suspicious about what um, the ones he calls like the spiritual empirics, those who rely on, on inner experience about in, in matters of faith. So we, we see that the, ra the rationalist tradition is more cautious about the possibility, the, the, the cognitive possibility of inner experience. Um, nonetheless, Wolf himself, for example, in his writing about uh, the, the influence of philosophy on the superior faculty, he mentions the possibility of a, an experimental theology, which was very much in the spirit of the time. If we think, for example, to the text of Arnold at the beginning of the century, the Theologia Experimentalis, uh, in which uh, he argues for experience as the cornerstone of uh, the believer's relationship to God. So yeah, I, I would say that the empirical tradition is much more um, closer to this uh, Protestant view um, handed down uh, from Luther himself of a uh, cognitio experimentalis. But also the rationalist um, domain is not stranger to, to it, simply more cautious and uh, more, more like, um, yeah, uh, more, more cautious about uh, the possibility of applying. For example, when Baumgarten dies, uh, he uh, says the, the famous uh, sentence uh, that only faith is the demonstratio demonstration, which is actually uh, a sentence coming from Alsted, I think. Mm, so, he raises a, a bit of upheaval in the in the rationalistic domain because it seemed like giving priority to this kind of experience or aesthetic a aspect uh, uh, before reason. Okay, <laughs> I, I reconnect the image. Okay, uh, Karen. Yeah, so unless someone else uh, wants to go first, yeah, so please uh, let me know if someone else wants to go first. Uh, but um, if I may, I would like to ask um, uh, a question to Ursula about um, 
the distinction between empiricism and rationalism because I got a bit confused because I, I thought that at the beginning you you were kind of in favor of problematizing uh, the opposition, but then um, you also said with regard to the um, four divisions of our volume uh, that, that these divisions are maybe not very convincing because in the end all contributors, not all authors that are being discussed either fall within a kind of more empiricist or a more rationalist framework. So apparently you want to hold on to using these categories to, um, to clarify these positions. Whereas I feel that, um, well, that unless you, you are very, very specific about what is intended by these terms, they, they do not really uh, serve the purpose of, of clarifying uh, the debates at the time. Um, I'm not surprised I have had that discussion with Dan Garber various times because he always concludes discussion about empiricism and rationalism with saying we should just give up about the whole oppositional pair of concepts. But I think the fight between the two camps throughout the 18th century clearly indicates that there is an opposition. So we can coin new names for those camps, but that will be even harder. So we should just go with the uh, names we have coined through Kant and Hegel, but better understand what they actually do. So they are not distinguished by their pro-experience or contra-experience, they both have a, their own approach to experience, which is very different. I think that Leibniz has a much more sophisticated concept of experience as Kant ever had. And that is also true, of course, for, for Wolf. And they both knew science very well. Leibniz even added or provided material empirical knowledge from a friend in Germany to Newton, that Newton could better um, accomplish his uh, theory of the, of the deviation of the moon from the um, calculated um, orbits. So Leibniz was completely on top of reading all those experiential work of all kinds. He was a friend with Marriott in Paris and he uh, knew the experiments of Boyle. So he was well informed about all that and very interested. And so was Wolf. And Wolf himself did a lot of experiments, right? So um, rationalists do experimental work and highly appreciate it. And uh, I think that empiricists, if you look over the entire field, never did as much experiments. You know, Newton is a famous exception, and he is the major weapon of empiricism in their own favor. Without Newton, they had never won the field. So because of that great exception, they could win the battle in the end, in the 18th century. And I think that uh, empiricists had a very traditional notion of experience, namely just sense perceptions. And I agree with, uh, with the author of that uh, good, very detailed chapter on the Thomasians, who is not present today, that there are different developments and you know new distinctions in the course of from Thomasius up to Crucius. But nonetheless, it all remains uh, with sense perception. And they never had a great uh, understanding of experiment in a methodical way. And so all they needed with experience was to limit the capacity of reason. So in order to reject reasoning and modern science as a threat to religion, they had to 
develop experience as a tool in order to cut off reason that it, that it couldn't go everywhere. And that kind of ideology, I would call that, because it was more driven by motives than by argument, actually. Yep. That is what I think we should take into account to understand that battle between empiricism and rationalism in the 18th century, okay. already in the 17th. I think that is already between Boyle and Spinoza when you look at their exchange mediated by Oldenburg and the correspondence of Spinoza. There you have it. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think this really clarifies uh, the matter. So you want to hold on to the, as, as it were, the labels, but, um, but specify um, what they actually mean in terms of the role they grant to you know proper experiments. Yeah. Um, yes, that's clear. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, and I would just mention the word hypothesis. That is such an underestimated term, and it has so much um, attack by Newtonians, right? Mm -hmm. Because Newton never wanted to make hypothesis. That was directed against Leibniz and Descartes, and that is still in our own days the major tool you know to develop a theory with hypothesis and then to counter check with experience with experiments actually yeah and meanwhile it is even done in medicine it was really a surprise i heard a radio program recently about um med medical science cluster here in berlin in recent years and they made the claim as Leibniz would have uh, celebrated that they don't uh, work any longer to heal um, diseases by experience, etc. but they want to understand the mechanism and the origin, the causes of the disease, and then kind of to trace, to trace it back and then to, to um, remove the causes in order to heal the patient. And that is a purely rational argument. You know, of course, it is always backed with experience and ex by experiments, actually. But that is what has always been denied until the 19th century that medicine can ever, ever get there. That is now our modern understanding, even in medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Farah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little, but maybe very much puzzled with this comparison between uh, theological and scientific truths that Dr. Goldenbaum told us that they are the same. Uh, I was wondering how believing in theological and scientific truths would be the same. I can understand that, uh, for example, being cautious to the possibility of uh, inner experience is, is something uh, significant to be aware of, but uh, in what sense uh, do you say that they are the same? So when you say that Newton believed in his uh, truth of uh, natural laws, the same way a theologue would. I'm not sure if I understood the question. So um, that Newton believed in the truth of his theory of his yeah, law. Yeah. yeah. If, if I'm not mistaken, you told us that uh, it's the same with a uh, theologue when he thinks of some inner experience. No, that, that is not the same. No, I, that there are two different points. What I said is that empiricists, because of their theological motives, have a much more intense interest in inner experience because that is how we, where we meet God, right? where we have mysterious experiences and um, awakenings, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a very a big topic for theologians. But Newton, um, although he was very much interested in theology, as we know, for the last 70 years, uh, and even translated the Old Testament, et cetera, et cetera, and he did more writings on Hebrew and theology uh, and uh, in the last period of his life than ever about physics again. But um, as long as he worked as a scientist and he was in the first part, a mathematician. 
and his mathematical principles are purely rational. But he himself said all he knows, he knows from experience, which is not quite right. Mm -hmm. Because he used Kepler's uh, laws, mm -hmm. he used the law of falling bodies of Galileo. They are all based on rational considerations and demonstrations, a lot of mathematics. And also Newton claims um, that there are atoms uh, the, bird is, the word is created from, right, by God. But nobody ever has seen an atom at that time. So it was not by experience whoever that he knew that. So there's a, in his metaphysics, there's a lot of contradictions. There are a lot of contradictions and it is rather confused. He is not a very clear thinker when it comes to metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And that has been recognized over the last years when we came to know his, all his manuscripts, etc. But there's also some research from Janjek and uh, Schlieser edited the volume on Newton. And so there is more discussion about his philosophy meanwhile. Yeah, so your point is that his belief in something which is not from experience is the same as the belief of theologian or uh, some theological belief. No. You know, Wolf had a concept of experience, and that was mainly experiment. Of course, in the cosmology, cosmology he couldn't do experiments, right? But um, at least something which is then done in analogy to experiments, based on precise observation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so you can have a concept of experience, and Newton also could have that as a scientist. But nonetheless. The reception of Newton in Germany in particular, but also in England uh, via the books of uh, William Weston, who was a Newtonian and even the follower of uh, Newton on the chair at uh, Oxford, um, uh, who taught mathematics and physics, but he also wrote very mysterious books on religion. Um, so there was a, that was a move of Newtonianism and there, um, that was very much received by German theologians. They all knew these, not all, but those who would be authors, they all knew this wave of Newtonianism. They knew that argument that if I can't know the essence of something like gravity, I can still know by experience that it exists. And therefore, if I cannot know how Jesus Christ was will save us. He still promised it, and, and we know that by history. And we also know that there is a lot of uh, you know, mi miraculous uh, event, which makes it more probable. And all the people reported from the time it has happened. So that is historical knowledge. And that is as certain as we know that gravity exists. Yes. That was a very, very common uh, argument. And I was really surprised recently when I found it even in a discussion of Lessing with theologians about the fragments of Raymarus. It still popped up. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's almost like a meme of, of the time, right? Yeah, thank you. OK, Courtney. Um, OK, going back to the discussion between Karen and Ursula, if I could, um, about empiricism and rationalism, my, my personal preference would be to get rid of them. Um, not, not because Ursula is wrong that there's an opposition. There's definitely an, an opposition. But this is exactly the kind of crutch that seems to, conceptual crutch, that seems to infiltrate and be used in education in a way that makes it difficult continuously to have a more subtle point of view because it immediately gets rejected because it flies in the face of, of some kind of, um, you know, we even teach modern philosophy, you know, um, three, three rationalists, three empiricists. Um, that's how it's taught in North America. That's how it's taught in a lot of places. So it really, it, it's, it's a problem, I think. It teaches a kind of uh, rigidity of, of concepts that is just not helpful. Um, I wanted to push back on something that, that, or at least maybe put it in a different light, something that Ursula said earlier. You said that the main intention of empiricists is to, or, or at least one of the main points is to limit reason. 
and that the reason, and you, and you said the reason kind of empiricist one is because of Newton. But on the other side, I feel like one of the reasons that rationalists lost was because they wanted to limit the input of experience, right? Through these kinds of arguments that something like universal attraction is impossible. And that's what I think a lot of people, um, the, or the young Kant, I think, is one of the reasons he defends action at a distance, right? I and mean, he, he defends the idea that um, we can have a mathematical description of laws like the law of gravitation without being able ever to demonstrate the truth of it rationally uh, without appeal to experience. So, um, I mean, even the early letters of, you know, the letters of Descartes, you read where someone is writing to him about, there's a specific letter about fish hearts and whether fish blood and fish hearts work the way human hearts work, right? Um, because he had this kind of, this like uh, the heart is warm and blood expands when the heart heats it, right? And so it's this mechanical action of the heart, right? And, uh, and Descartes' response is, you know, condescending. Uh, your theory of the heart can't be right because the heart has to be mechanical because anything but strictly mechanical explanation is impossible. I mean, if, if that's the position that this Newton seems to want to defend and Leibniz to defend, that mechanism in the kind of simple sense is the, is the only possible, rationally possible kind of explanation, then most of modern science that we have today would be impossible, right? Because we cannot reduce Huh? I can't hear you. You're, I think you're... Um... <laughs> I always turn off my mic, so... Um, yeah. I, I don't quite agree. First of all, I don't agree with the change of the names, because if you would have two other names to give to the opposed camps, I wouldn't mind, but that would be very difficult to introduce, because it's yeah. such a long tradition. But because there are two camps which are opposed and fight each other, I still think we need names for each of them. So, so much for that. And then yeah. I just think what I just ex uh, told you about that radio program I heard about medicine in our days, right? All first class scientists who spoke in that program, they, uh, that is exactly um, how Mechanical is not just mechanics. Mechanical stands for natural explanation. It, it has no supernatural power. It has to be naturally explained. As Lessing said, I asked you to explain everything naturally to me when he talked with Jacobi about Spinoza. And I think that's all what it means. It is not meant like billiard balls, um, that that is how nature has to be explained. And that is very clear already from Spinoza and from Leibniz. I'm not so sure about Descartes, but uh, I think that is a general idea of rationalism. What do you think? I mean, what what do you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with these. So, so how are you interpreting these you know, arguments that Wolf and, and Leibniz make that action at a distance is impossible yeah. and supernatural because it's not mechanical, although it follows a strict law. And this was Kant's position later, which is if it follows a, a law, it's no longer mysterious. Whereas the previous, it seemed like Leibniz's position was it's mysterious if it's not reducible to the simplified billiard ball mechanical explanation. And there's some, some idea that Newton himself kind of felt that way as well, right? Um, though his followers did. He just, yeah, he just said he cannot explain it. But no, nonetheless, Newton kind of suggested a little bit that there are forces which we don't know because he had other forces yeah, yeah. to talk about, right? But um, which we will never know, but they are kind of divine. And but what I mean is if the uh, denial of the action of uh, at a distance by Leibniz and Wolf is just that they couldn't accept um, that this is that reason should stop with explanations. So they would rather continue to search for a reason 
while Newton didn't. He just said it's impossible to know for human beings. But uh, that when his followers, and that is mostly the criticism, would claim that action at a distance is, is kind of explained by attraction, that matter would attract. That is just against the opinion of Leibniz and Wolf, and in a way also of Newton, that matter could be active. Because if matter would have attraction, then it would be active, right? So that, yeah. that, that is the only reason, yeah. Action at a distance is just something, what kind of action actually, that's the question. How? And you know, it doesn't have to be mechanical necessarily, but it has to happen by some impact of a cause. And of course in physics, meanwhile we know there are big fields in the universe, right? So there is not actually an empty space between us and all the other bodies. But so it's, it seemed to come. Yeah, I mean, my my just my 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 understanding is that um, action. So the, the the reason that they give for rejecting action at a distance is because they understand that all uh, essentially in the billiard ball model of me of me mechanism, everything has to act locally um, through contact, and so something some action not through contact to them they argue is is contradictory right it's it, 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 it's, it, it's against the principle of sufficient reason yeah because definitely. there is um but but the, so the more progressive area of physics uh or someone like newton is thinking that um if it's well if it's well supported by experimentation and can be precisely described in the law that it follows then there is no a priori reason to reject the existence of such an action. And so, um, yeah, that's just how I, 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 I mean, Leibniz seems to just explicitly, he says he's a mechanist, right? He's a, he's a hardcore mechanist and he explicitly that points out what mechanism is, right? As you say, it's that matter is not active, that it acts only locally um, and so on. And you, that's why someone like Descartes is forced to think of, a tr of like glue as Velcro, right? because there can be no electrostatic forces. There can be no attraction. There can be, these have to be impossible. Um, but you know, all those forces you just mentioned, they don't act at a distance. By acting at a distance, it is really yeah. meant that there's an empty space between the two events. And that is- Yeah, I, 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 I would say that, you know, yeah. Nobody- the, 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 in the in the future, future, you know, e even though that that's true, because but that that doesn't answer the full kind of position, because even those the the most, you know, go to quantum mechanics or whatever today, um, we reach a grant, we reach a final position at which there is no ex, there is, admittedly, no possible further explanation. We think right. At, at some point there will be, it's, it's never that quantum mechanics is gonna go back to mechanics. I was told it is solved by Einstein, but it is really true that we move into areas where we are not very competent. But I, anyway, as you. a physicist at my, uh, at our department, at, you know, at the parallel department at Emory, and he told me that Einstein gave an explanation for that, a kind of natural explanation. Yes, but, but not mechanism. Not work yeah. with a, with an action at a distance. Okay, perhaps we can continue this uh, dialogue in the informal part. Um, so I'll leave the um, I'll leave the Zoom link open, and meanwhile bring the formal session to a close. So I want to once again thank um, all of our speakers and uh, our editors and our audience and everybody who uh, joined us today. And I want to simultaneously invite you for our next session which is on October 7th, and it will consist of three short papers on Novalis. Okay, so um, thank you very much again, and um, see you next time.